Welcome in Fox Sports Radio Studios brought to you by Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit geico.com for a free rate quote as well. Your car's needs now come with a reward with the AutoZone Rewards program. Spend $20 five times and earn a $20 reward. So sign up today. Get in the zone. AutoZone. You know who's in the zone? It's the Golden State Warriors. And they, after watching again the Cavs game last night against the Celtics, credit to the Cavs. They got a win. They're going to win the Eastern Conference Finals. They eliminated any doubt about that by going up 3-1. Because after all, who could ever give up a 3-1 lead in the NBA Finals? But, in general, the Cavs are a flawed basketball team that is going, I believe, to get dominated by the Warriors. I watched last night's game with that in mind. The Cavs are going to win this game, even when they were down 10 at the half, even when LeBron James got his fourth foul, six minutes left in the second quarter. To me, there was no doubt. The Cavs were going to find a way to win this basketball game. And so I was watching almost entirely to figure out, how do I see this matchup going? What's going to happen when the Warriors and the Cavs meet up starting next Thursday? And again, I know Cavs have to go to Boston. Maybe they even lose in Boston in Game 5. Maybe they have to come back for Game 6 in Cleveland. All that's going to do is take a little bit of their legs, zap a little bit of their energy, make it even more likely that the Warriors are going to dominate. I'm telling you right now, Warriors in 5. And to me, the question that you can already start to ask is, who's got more at stake here, Kevin Durant or LeBron James? Because already you can hear the drumbeat of the LeBron apologists saying, well, this is not really fair because Kevin Durant chose to chase a title and go sign with Golden State. Now, I've been defending Kevin Durant ever since he made the decision to go to Golden State, even though I think it was bad for the overall NBA. And if you listen to this show, you know that I've given you my plan on what I would do to make the NBA more competitive again. It's frustrating. Tonight, uh, we uh, last night we saw... The Ottawa Senators beat the Pittsburgh Penguins. I'm not sure if you're an NHL guy. I don't know if you care at all, but we're going to Game 7 there. And already the Nashville Predators have advanced to the Stanley Cup Finals as the 8th seed out of the Western Conference. You watch the NHL, you watch a hockey game, anything can happen. Other than the one upset where the Cavs gave up a 21-point lead to the Celtics on, I guess, Sunday night, right, or whatever day it was, then there's been absolutely no suspense for any of the games that have really mattered in the NBA this year. And that flies in the face of pretty much every other sport, where if we care about it in America, typically gets in the playoffs, anything can happen. Whether it's the NFL, Major League Baseball, college basketball with the NCAA tournament, college football now with the four-game playoff, and also all the complexity of who is going to get into the four-game playoff, since the entire season is in many respects a playoff, and obviously the NHL. Anything can happen in those playoffs. The challenge for the NBA is that nothing unexpected happens in the NBA playoffs and that I think we're likely going to roll into the NBA Finals with the Cavs and the Warriors having combined to go 24-1 and in the playoffs. That ain't good for the NBA. But Kevin Durant did exactly what we always say we want athletes to do. He took less money to go chase a championship. How many times have you heard people say, oh, of course, insert athlete here took the most money? Remember back in the day when NFL free agency really started and Reggie White went on his tour all around the NFL and then he signed, I believe it was with the Green Bay Packers, and he said he signed with Green Bay because God told him to sign with Green Bay. And then somebody came back with a great retort and said, man, and it definitely applies in free agency for the most part. It's amazing how often God tells somebody to sign for the most money. (laughs) And it's a great line. But that's one of the number one criticisms of guys in pro sports, right? That they care about money more than they care about championships. Well, Kevin Durant flips that on its head. He takes substantially less money to go to Golden State to get a championship. And what do people criticize him for? Going to Golden State to get a championship. And ultimately, what this proves to me is you can't win. It really doesn't matter what decisions you make when you're in the public eye. You're going to get criticized. And frankly, criticized by people like me. All over the country, I'm just a representation of how people respond to sports decisions. Well, from that moment when Kevin Durant made the decision on July 4th to go to the Golden State Warriors, I think he actually increased the pressure on himself. Because if he goes to Golden State and the Warriors lose in this NBA Finals, despite the fact that they have four of the top players in all the NBA, four of the top 10, four of the top 15, four of the top 20, whatever you want to call it, depending on how you quantify overall talent, Klay Thompson, Draymond Green, Steph Curry, and Kevin Durant are maybe the best team in the history of the NBA. I said yesterday that if the Warriors 
who have gone 67 and 15 in the regular season, who have not lost a game with all four of their big four playing since February freaking the fourth. And that was an overtime game a long time ago to Sacramento, I believe. This team is a juggernaut. Right now, they are 12 and 0. If they go 4 and 1 and win this NBA Finals in five games over the Cavs, which I think they'll do. That would make them 16-1 and and mean that the Warriors would have the best postseason performance in the history of any NBA team. Right now, the best postseason performance is the Lakers that beat the 76ers 4-1. to Kobe Bryant's crew swept into the NBA Finals that year. They went 11-0 and in the postseason, then went 4-1 and in the NBA Finals. 15-1. and Back then, you only had to win three in the first round. 15-1 and is the best ever. I think that if this year's Warriors having won 67 in the regular season, which is one of the best seasons of all time, having dealt with the injury to Durant and basically tried to make sure that they took some games off and rested in order not to challenge the 73-9 and best record in the history of the NBA, if they then follow it up by going 16-1 and in the playoffs or 16-0, and it's the best team in the history of the NBA. And I think they are going to obliterate the Cleveland Cavaliers. I think last year was an aberration. I think that Golden State was better than Cleveland last year. I think what happened was in game four, the wheels came off. Even though the Warriors won, they lost Draymond Green. They came back home. They lost game five. And as a result, credit to the Cavs. They came storming back and LeBron James brought a title back to Cleveland. But that is not going to happen in this year's NBA Finals. And I think it's a fascinating question. Who has more pressure on them? Because you start to break down LeBron James's resume. He's won every close title that he could have won. Everybody who says, oh, six rings matter. We're going to compare him to Michael Jordan every single game that he plays. I'm not that guy. You listen to this show, every game that LeBron James plays, I'm not coming in and saying, oh, well, that, now let's assess how his uh, resume compares to Michael Jordan. But I am an end of the season. Like, let's compare these overall guys. And my position on this is not that outlandish. It's not that wacky. It's not that much of a hot take. It is that LeBron James and Michael Jordan are the two greatest basketball players of all time. They're 1A and 1B. I personally think that Jordan is better. I think that Jordan is 1A and LeBron is 1B. But Jordan's resume is rested pretty soundly on six straight titles and honestly would have been eight titles if Jordan hadn't decided to go play baseball. They would have won the two titles, sorry Houston, that the Houston Rockets won. And if that had happened, then Houston might be the saddest sports city in America instead of Washington, D.C. You take away those two titles that the Rockets won while Michael Jordan was pursuing baseball, and oh man, the city of Houston takes a big shot right in the gut in terms of its championship caliber. So, I think you look at this and say, okay, Michael Jordan never won a really close series in terms of barely winning, right? Does that make sense? Every game that, every series that Michael Jordan won, the Bulls won in six games or less. Every one of the six titles. You look at LeBron James's titles. He's two plays, guys, from having been to whatever it is, six finals and having won one. Now, Sometimes it's dragging teams that didn't deserve to the finals to be there. But if Ray Allen misses that three-point shot in the corner against the Spurs, guess what? The Heat don't have that title. And in Game 7, or really in many of the games last year against the Warriors, if Draymond Green doesn't get suspended, then I think the Warriors win Game 5. And everybody this year is talking about how the Cavs have really no chance because the Cavs would be, the Warriors would be the two-time defending champs, and they would have already beaten the Cavs like a drum the past two seasons, and then they would have added Kevin Durant. But now that he's brought a title back to Cleveland, I think LeBron James's pressure is diminished, even if he never wins another title. And I think there's a decent chance that LeBron James never wins another title. In fact, if I were betting on it right now, that's what I would say. Now, it's hard to know. Maybe in the final couple of years of LeBron James's career, he's going to go join a team like Kevin Durant did. He can be a super team guy and go get a couple of rings just because the team is unbelievable. That seems to be what NBA teams are doing, stacking talent, making it so only one or two teams can actually contend for a championship. But I think when this series begins, the pressure is on Kevin Durant, squarely. Because he's the one who decided to chase a championship. He's the one who took less money. He's the one on potentially the greatest team in the history of the NBA. Whereas LeBron James is just trying to do what he's already done before. It helps LeBron James if he is able to go out and get a fourth title. It certainly helps his reputation in terms of being the greatest NBA player of all time 
But at this point in his career, LeBron James is competing with history. At this point in Kevin Durant's career, there is no history. There is no championship history. And so getting that first championship, the way we judge guys, it cleanses him forever. It's just like in the Super Bowl, if you're the team that has never won, Matt Ryan, I think, had a lot more at stake this year than Tom Brady did. Now, Brady and the Patriots came back from a 28-3 deficit. If Tom Brady loses that game, it doesn't really change his legacy as potentially the greatest quarterback of all time. If Matt Ryan wins that game, sorry Atlanta Falcon fans who have to relive this for a long time, Matt Ryan wins that game, he becomes a made man. We judge guys based on championships. And I think that's a similar comparison to where we are right now. LeBron James, love him or hate him, is going to be considered by even the most hated LeBron James fan out there, the guy who lives to denigrate LeBron James's accomplishments, he's going to be a top five player in the history of the NBA. And arguably, if you have a functional brain, I think you have to make him one of the top two players in the history of the NBA. His resume not changing that much no matter what happens. Whereas Kevin Durant, it's a lot at stake here. Awful lot at stake. I do think it's fascinating. Guys, put this under your cap and remember it. How much we criticize a guy no matter what choice he makes. Because you know what people would have said if Kevin Durant had re-upped with Oklahoma City? Oh, well, that's great, but he's never going to win a championship now. Why are they going to be better than the Warriors? Maybe you think Oklahoma City would have been good enough to win a championship. I don't think so. Would have definitely made the NBA more interesting. But Kevin Durant takes less money and pursues a championship. It's what we always say we want guys to do, and what, what immediately happens, he gets crushed. No doubt at all. All right, guys. Loaded show today. We're going to talk, give you some gambling tips at the bottom of the hour. We have got John Campbell from Odd Shark coming on, and there are two Game 7s that are happening on Thursday night. So that's going to be a pretty fun night if you like the NHL and you like the NBA. Sorry, not two Game 7s. One Game 7, the NHL Game 7. And the Cavs, of course, are going to close out the Celtics in Game 5 and get set for what we hope will end up being a seven-game series in the NBA Finals. We'll get you some gambling tips on those series and more. We will also going to talk to Jason Whitlock. And I guarantee you got to get Whitlock up out there on the West Coast. Hour three is going to blow your mind. If you are not signed up and subscribed to the podcast, I would encourage you to now go download the podcast. Maybe you only get to hear 10, 12 minutes of the show every day. Get hooked up with the Outkick podcast. It's on iTunes. There's also an afternoon show you can listen to that doesn't have FCC restrictions and is me reacting to the biggest stories of the day there on Periscope, Facebook Live, but also on the podcast. I'm encouraging you guys again Go download the podcast. I am Clay Travis. You are listening to Outkick the Coverage. And this, my friends, is Fox Sports Radio. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio studios. Great news. Quick way you could save money. Switch to Geico. Go to geico.com and in 15 minutes you could save 15% or more on car insurance. I'm here uh, with y'all. Hope your Wednesday is going spectacularly well. I'm down in the great state of Florida where we got an incredible story that I'm going to talk about with Jeff Schwartz in hour two. While I'm down here, did you guys see the story about the guy who blamed his gigantic penis for a murder? Uh, Oral sex related. Again, hour two, Jeff Schwartz are going to dive into this more so. But he was acquitted of murder. Maybe the most amazing self-defense ever argued in the history of American jurisprudence. Guy got off for murdering his wife or girlfriend. I'm not sure which. And he claimed that she choked to death on his gigantic penis. That's a brilliant lawyer. Makes me sometimes wonder why I stopped practicing law. Come up with that kind of win. Walk out of the courtroom. You're like, I can't believe the jury bought it either. It worked, though. Got acquitted. Um, Speaking of getting acquitted, Kyrie Irving is getting LeBron James acquitted of a lot of blame because if the Cavs had ended up playing like they looked in the first half, then the narrative would be totally different today. We'd be talking about, wow, Celtics went into Cleveland and did what they did to Chicago. They lost the first two on the road, looked awful, and then bounced back and won, lost the first two at home, and then bounced back and won the next two on the road. We'd be talking about a really exciting Game 5 on Thursday. Instead, Cavs had an incredible third quarter, thanks to Kyrie Irving, and put away, I think, the Celtics. Again, we've seen a 3-1 comeback, but I don't see it coming in this series, and that's why we're talking already about the Warriors and the Cavs upcoming. 
bring in the crew. Do you guys agree with me that Kevin Durant has more pressure on him in the NBA Finals based on the decision to go to Golden State and take less money and chase a championship? I think that Kevin Durant has a lot more pressure on him in the NBA Finals than LeBron James is going to have on him. Now, if LeBron had not won last year, that would be flipped, I think, because everybody would still be asking the question, can LeBron James ever do it in Cleveland? The pressure would have continued to grow. I think that that pressure would all be on LeBron James. But now, I think, look, all LeBron can do is make his legacy better. It doesn't get impacted in a negative way by him losing to the Warriors because all the LeBron defenders will just say, well, and you're already starting to hear him say it, well, what do you expect? When Kevin Durant decided to go join a team that was already nearly a championship team, he created a super team. What do you expect LeBron James to do? He's only got Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love. He doesn't have three of the top 20 players in the NBA alongside of him like Kevin Durant does. I think the pressure is ratcheted up to a large extent on Kevin Durant. Now, I don't think it's going to matter because I think the Warriors are going to win this series in five, and I don't think we're going to get into pressure pack situations in game six and game seven. But do you guys agree with me? Let's go around the horn, bring in Jason Martin. Do you guys agree with me that Kevin Durant has more pressure on him than LeBron James does in the upcoming NBA Finals? Uh, I, I, I mean, to some extent. The only thing about the pressure for Kevin Durant is Kevin Durant himself doesn't have to go out there and get 30 every night for them to win because of the way that team is constructed. He does have pressure in terms of if he goes up there and he doesn't win, that's one thing. But Kevin Durant's going to play fine because it's not like the Cavs can triple team Kevin Durant because of everything else that's on the floor for Golden State. So I do you I agree with me? It's going to be a five game series. No, like we're I don't. building this thing up. It's going to be a great series. Oh, I can't wait for the NBA Finals. That's what NBA guys out there are arguing. Yeah, yeah. So what? The Cavs went twenty, you know, twelve and one, and the Warriors went twelve and zero. Oh, but this NBA Finals is going to be so good. It's like you're waiting around for. Uh, you know, like a great dessert, even though you know the meal is not very good itself. You're like, yeah, this sucks, but man, we got some incredible pecan pie coming, or key lime pie, or that cobbler is going to be extraordinary. And then you get it, and it tastes like crap. That's what I think is going to happen. Yeah, I don't. I think it's. A, I think it's going to go six. I do think Golden State will win it. Golden State would have lost two against San Antonio. They were definitely going to lose game one. I have no doubt in my mind about that. If Kawhi doesn't get hurt, I think the Spurs get two out of them. I don't think we're having this talk about the one-loss Warriors being the greatest team in the history of the NBA. I don't necessarily think they are based on the way that this playoffs has played out. They Who's haven't better? Been challenged yet. Who's better? That's an interesting question. So if, if, if really the Warriors are not the best team, and, and I understand it's hard to compare teams over eras, but if the, this year's Warriors are not the best team in the history of the NBA, if they win this, and I know we're jumping ahead a little bit, but look, they went 12-0 and in the NBA Finals, I mean, the NBA playoffs so far, and now they're in the with NBA an Finals, and I think they're going to do it in five. I don't, I don't do the asterisk stuff because people get hurt all the time. Like, they dominated in a lot of these games. Most of the games they won were not close. It's easy to lose early in the first round or second round when you're a lot better than everybody else. They dominated. And so even when they got down by, you know, whatever it was, 23 points in the first game against the Spurs, they came back from 22 points down on the road against San Antonio at the end of March, I think on March 30th. So I understand everybody out there, like all the Spurs hardcore fans are like, oh, if we still had Kawhi Leonard, like there are guys tweeting me right now, like, oh, the Warriors aren't that good. If Kawhi Leonard hadn't gotten hurt, we would have won the series. Stop. You're making yourself look dumb. Who is a better team? Danny G and Justin. Who's a better team out there if it's not the Warriors? If the Warriors, let's say, go 16-1, and post the best NBA postseason record of all time, what team in the history of the NBA is better? What team would you take head up, straight up, against these Warriors? I would say the 2001 Lakers. I mean, you did point out yesterday that, uh, you know, it was the best of five back then uh, in the early rounds. So, yes. Yeah. But had it not been, the Lakers still would have swept their way through. Had it not been for Allen Iverson taking over game one of the NBA Finals all by himself, the Lakers probably would have swept the Sixers in the Finals. So that that Lakers team that year was just a bulldozer. Yeah, they were great. But would you really take them over this year's Golden State Warriors? I don't know. i got to see the Warriors in, in the Finals because you're – I mean, you are convinced that the Warriors are just going to – 
run, I believe they run are them going, over. See, I'm yeah, not. They but but I'm ob- not either. I, the Cavs. Okay, but what if Kevin Love and Kyrie Irving show up big time and LeBron plays inspired ball? I'm not so sure. It's They're just, still not good enough to win. They're not good enough to win, but I don't think it's the cakewalk you think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a total cakewalk. I think everybody's built up this idea that the NBA Finals is going to be great. I think Vegas agrees with me. Vegas is looking at this saying, damn, the Warriors are going to dominate this Cavs team. Because I think they're taking a lot of Cavs money. Because right now you can get the Cavs at 3-1 to to win this series. Vegas is looking at it saying, just laughing at the bank, laughing and going to the bank. I just, I I don't buy into it. I, I don't know what's going on with LeBron, but he seems like his jump shot has deserted him. He, I think he was awful from three in the past few games. I think the wear and tear on LeBron is starting to show up a little bit. Now, maybe I mean, not. He had four maybe. fouls last night in the first half. Like, that's – he even said after the game, he's like, I don't think I've ever had four fouls in the first half of a game. Like, that was that was a little strange. Looking back on some of these other teams, you know, you can make an argument for the 95-96 Bulls for sure. With Jordan, the year after he came back, or it was Jordan Pippen, Rodman – Tony Kukoc, you had Steve Kerr coming off the bench, Ron Harper at point guard, Luke Longley. That was a really good okay. balanced team. He, here's an easy question to ask. I mean, when I think about like best players, and, and obviously it's not top to bottom because I think a lot of times the NBA is so skewed towards the top because you're only playing by the time you get to the NBA Finals, what? At most eight or nine guys, typically. And a lot of those guys are playing like 10 minutes or less if you look at the box score because it's a little bit like the NCAA tournament, everybody shortens their bench by the time they get to the finals and wants as many minutes from the top guys as they can get. Has there ever been an NBA title team that has had four Hall of Famers on it before? Because I think all four of the top guys on the Warriors are going to be in the Hall of Fame, right? I don't think, I mean, there are people out there probably who want to argue that, but does anybody doubt that right now Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, and Kevin Durant are likely all four Hall of Famers. Now, look, could they, could they could we have like an awful injury that knocks somebody out? Yes. I'm talking about right now, if you were judging their careers based on what they've done on the court, I think all four of them would be Hall of Famers. And probably the most questionable would be Clay Thompson. I think that's probably fair. 85-86 Celtics, I think, have four, right? Because they had Parrish, McHale, Dennis Johnson, and Bill Walton. Plus, they had Danny Ainge. The first four I mentioned, I believe, are all in the Hall of Fame. And, of course, Ainge wasn't a slouch himself. But by that time, and I'm not an expert on the 85-86 Celtics. I'm sure somebody listening is. But by that time, I believe Bill Walton was already vastly on the back end of his career, right? He never had, you know, he yeah, was, no, like, that's the true. four guys The four guys firing on all cylinders right now are all at the peak of their game. It's not like there's a guy on the bench right now who is 36 years old and has almost nothing left in the tank and is going to be a Hall of Famer, but is kind of dragging down the stretch. Like, for instance, you could say the Spurs. Manu Ginobili, I think, is a Hall of Famer. People might think that's crazy. I saw you tweet about that, Jason Martin. Yes. I think Manu Ginobili is a Hall of Famer. But Manu Ginobili right now on the Spurs is not a Hall of Fame player, right? I mean, it's, it's fair to say that his career has been a Hall of Fame career, but that right now he's not firing on all cylinders. It's a good debate, good topic. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but right now let's go ahead and find out what's trending and go get my guy, uh, John Campbell from Odd Shark, try to make you some money from gambling. Let's find out what's trending What's trending now. Welcome back. Fox Sports Radio Studios brought to you by GEICO. It's easy to save 15% or more on car insurance with GEICO. Go to GEICO.com or call 800-947-AUTO. The only hard part, figuring out which way is easier, as well as with True Car, you can find out what other people in your area paid for the same car you're looking for and on average save over three grand off MSRP. Whether you're looking for a new or used car, Visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. We bring in now John Com- John Campbell. He's at Odd Shark, uh, the uh, the top guy there at Odd Shark when it comes to trying to make you money and break down all the games that are going on. You can check out Odd Shark for your gambling and informational related needs, and check out his articles there as well. And John Campbell, let's start with the question we've kind of been debating on this show to start with. I believe, obviously, that the Cavs are going to close out the Celtics. Now they're up three one. And also that the Warriors are sitting there waiting. I think that the Warriors are going to win this game in five games or will win this series in five games or less. Crazy or would Vegas say there's some truth to what I'm selling here? Yeah, Vegas would say there's some truth. And, and the Warriors are, are up to minus 335 favorites to win it all now. So, yeah, Vegas is definitely leaning that way. I think it might be six. Uh, I, I think uh, – I think – Cleveland's going to play its best basketball when it gets to the finals. I think it's it's falling down a little bit against Boston, weaker competition here. But uh, I think it'll be another good series. The, the line's out now, and Golden State is minus seven for game one. 
I think that's going to surprise some people. So thanks for letting us know that. So you can already bet on this game. Game one in, uh, in Arco Arena, I think they're out there in uh, in Golden State at Oakland. They are a seven-point favorite over the Cavs already. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Sorry. I, I mean, I, I think we all know uh, this will be the matchup. So, yeah, Golden State's minus seven. That, that's pretty much the same line where it opened up last year. Uh, the game one was was minus six and a half for Golden State. What's really interesting is the total is fourteen points higher. Last year's game one was two eleven. This year's game one is two twenty five. That's a massive game. So basically, what we're expecting, according to Vegas and the offshores, is both teams running up and down the court, ton of possessions, because that's a huge number, right? Two twenty five for an NBA Finals game. Yeah, it is a really big number, and uh, it's interesting because totals have been really sharp uh, the last several games in the NBA playoffs, and games have been finishing within a few points of the closing total. So uh, they've been pretty accurate in terms of predicting what's going to happen. You've been having a great deal of success, at least up to the last two games for the Cavs, when it comes to just almost flat-out betting the Warriors and the Cavs during these playoffs. That's not a surprise since overall – the Warriors and the Cavs, if I'm doing my math right, I think I'm doing my math right, are 23-1 and one so far in the playoffs. So straight up, 23-1. and one. How have they been doing against the number? Well, uh, the Warriors have especially been really good. They're 8-4 and four against the spread. And, and when you look back at the best NBA playoff winning streaks of all time, you do well just to go ahead and play them blindly against the spread. Almost always, they they come out uh, way ahead. Almost at seventy percent. Almost every single team that's won at least ten straight in the playoffs has covered the number at nearly seventy percent. So uh, that might be a good uh, formula to keep following. It might be easy just to blindly play the Warriors uh, moving forward. Do you think there's uh, an argument to be made here that the Warriors, if they win in let's say in five or less, like I'm saying, they would that they may be the greatest NBA team of all time? I mean, I, I always think it's fun. it would be fun to set hypothetical lines. I don't know how much Vegas does this or offshores do this to kind of assess the overall value of teams. You can go back and look at the Jordan Era Bulls, which of the Jordan Era Bulls teams was the best, which of the Celtics back in the day in their dynasty, which of the Lakers teams were the best. There's lots of dynasties in the NBA. Uniquely, I think, we move from one dynasty basically to another. Uh, do you think it's possible that this year's Warriors team, from a gambling perspective in terms of setting lines, would be favored against almost any team that's ever played in the history of the NBA? Yeah, I, I think so. I think they would be. I think it would be tight against some of the some of the best, but especially if they sweep the Cavs here, because the, the Cavs would be up there too in, in the discussion, I think, in the, over the last couple of years. But if they sweep the Cavs here, I think you can make a pretty good argument that they might be the best team ever. Are the Celtics better without Isaiah Thomas? Is that a ridiculous question to ask? No, I don't think so. I think they've played better. I don't think they want him out of the lineup, but I think they've played better and looked better the last two games. They've covered the spread uh, both games against Cleveland in the last two, and they've just looked better. they played better defense. Uh, they're making Cleveland a lot more uncomfortable. They're a better rebounding team. So it's interesting you take out one of the best players in the league here, but I think they'd love to have him, but I think right now they're better without him. Looking at Game 7 coming up in the NHL playoffs, the Penguins obviously are going to get to host the Ottawa Senators, Pittsburgh against Ottawa. What's the expectation here? Well, I, Pittsburgh will, will be favored as the home team. The home team usually wins Game 7, and uh, and it's always tough to win on the road in a Game 7. But I think on the other side, you have to be loving, if you're a Nashville fan, which I know you are, uh, that, that if Pittsburgh gets through, they're going to be coming off two back-to-back Game 7 series. And I think Nashville has, has the depth. That's the best thing they have going for them. So they're going to face a tired team either way here. And, uh, and they're now favored. Nashville will now be favored uh, one day. It's amazing after, after the Sens ups, uh, won and upset at home. Pittsburgh yesterday, now Nashville would be a slight favorite in the uh, finals. They'd be a slight favorite because there's a Game 7 left to be played, or you think that the Preds would be favored over either the Penguins or the Senators, depending on who they play? 
I think they will be now in the series final because this has gone to seven games, and I think a lot of people are expecting Pittsburgh to win. And it's not just a couple game sevens that they'll be coming off if they go to the finals. It's going back to last year, going all the way through and making a run and winning the Stanley Cup. Nobody's repeated in the NHL in 20 years, and I think there's a really good reason for that. It is just so hard to repeat uh, with this schedule in this league. Con Smythe and the NBA MVP, you can bet on these offshore. What are you seeing in terms of odds movement there? I'm assuming LeBron is a substantial favorite in the NBA just because he's probably going to be the best team, best player on the court. And then there's so many other good players for the Warriors. But what are we seeing in terms of the, uh, the Con Smythe? Uh, well, actually, Curry and Durant were favored. They're plus two fifty, plus two hundred, plus really? two fifty. They're oh, yeah, they're, I guess yeah, because you're assuming the Warriors are going to win the series. So usually the MVP comes from the winning team. So I should have thought about that. Right, right. So uh, and then and then uh, Crosby is top of the list uh, in the NHL. He's uh, a little better than two to one. And uh, not far behind is Pekka Rinne, who's played uh, amazing in Nets for Nashville. NBA draft odds. A lot of talk about the NBA draft lottery. Fultz, Markel Fultz, is now a substantial favorite to go to the Boston Celtics, number one overall. He's minus 500. Lonzo Ball coming in second at nearly plus 5-1. to one. Doesn't sound like there's going to be a lot of suspense as ter- in terms of the first two picks in this NBA draft. Is that fair to say based on what the gambling markets are telling us? Yeah, I think so. And and Fultz moved, uh, he moved from minus 500 to minus 600 overnight. So that seems to be even more solidified. Uh, I think everybody's getting what they want here, too. I think the Lakers are going to be happy with ball, and uh, it looks like everybody's going to come away a winner in this one. Would those guys make much of a difference in terms of the expectations for what the Celtics and the Lakers are likely to do on the court? In terms, There's a lot to talk about how good this year's NBA draft is, but are there really very many guys who are going to change expectations for their team based on who drafts them, or is this a situation where, for the most part, you have to wait on these guys to mature before Vegas really adjusts based on the draft? Well, there might be some adjustments, but usually in this case, uh, books will adjust just for the PR, just to talk about it and and, uh, get people looking at the lines and that sort of thing. But I really don't think either one of these guys or any other player in the draft this year is going to make a difference uh, that, that should be reflected in the odds. Outstanding stuff as always. Anything else I haven't asked you that we need to know? No, uh, no, I think that's it. Good luck to your Predators. I'm on them. I'm betting them game to game here, so it should be a fun final. This is John Campbell. Go follow him at Johnny Odd Shark on Twitter. He joins us every Wednesday to break down gambling markets and hopefully make you rich. I am Clay Travis. You are listening to Outkick. The coverage up next. We're going to try to get you some Animal Thunderdome news. Look out. They're after us. This is Fox Sports Radio. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio studios, what does it mean when Geico says just 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance? It means you probably should have gone to Geico.com 15 minutes ago. Big news in the Animal Thunderdome coming shortly. But did you guys see that I got criticized? This is a unique criticism for me. I got accused of being, um, uh, uh, like, people were fired up about me saying that you have to kill the sea lion. Did you guys see some of these tweets? I never know what people are going to get upset about uh, what I say or what I tweet. Um, but this was a uh, this was pretty interesting uh, yesterday. Um, I, I you know came on here and I said you have to kill everybody right who was involved in the uh, oh I've been blocked now. This guy came out and said uh, that it was unacceptable that I called for the death of the sea lions. They got the girl. Do we have that audio of the little girl getting dragged in? If you missed it, sea lion in Canada might have been a California sea lion. We don't know exactly drags a little girl into the uh, into the water and I said you got to kill the sea lion. There we go. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh, right. Are we all right? Barely, barely. Lucky to be alive. Once a sea lion goes after a six-year-old, you got to kill all the sea lions, even though you're not sure exactly which sea lion it was. Is it racist to say that all sea lions look the same? Yes. I'm not an expert. Is that racist? Can you be racist yes. against sea lions? Um, I think they all look the same. I mean, it's hard racist. for me to tell one sea lion from another. Uh, they, they look pretty much all the same to me. But here's the deal. We've got other major Animal Thunderdome news, and who else can you trust to keep you updated on the war between humanity and animals better then Clay Travis on Outkick the Coverage. Cue the music, boys. 
Ladies and gentlemen. I'm just glad I was there. Boys and girls. I thought he thought I was like this ginormous piece of chicken. Dying times here. This is Animal Thunderdome. Jason Martin, you have tracked down the Animal Thunderdome news, and I'm going to let you run with them, and then I will react to them. Does that make sense? That's fine with me. Brittany McClaney of Antioch, Alabama, found a couple of strange visitors in her drawers. I'm going to read this quote directly. When I reached in her panty drawer, there was this thing staring at me. I could see beady eyes, so I eased the drawer closed. Not one, Clay, not two, on three consecutive days, three opossums, all in this woman's panty drawer. These are some perverted possums. I got to say, there are so many people uncomfortable with you using the word panty this morning, Jason Martin. They woke up, the first thing they're going to hear is possums in the panty drawer, and they're just going right back to bed. My question on this in general would be, are they opening the drawer? How are they getting into the drawer? Or is there a hole on the backside, uh, rear entry, if you will, into the panty drawer? I don't know, but I'm curious how exactly this is happening. This seems like something that needs to be explained. Well, what if would... they're actually smart enough to open up a drawer, we got a major issue here. The possum community accelerating in intelligence at a rapid rate of speed. What we've heard is, or according to the handyman that came over the house... Quote, they were coming in from under the house and through the trap door and getting in the panty drawer. Now, a Again, lot of women I'm not will disputing leave a how they get into open. the house. I'm not disputing that they could get into the house, but to me, getting into the house and getting into the panty drawer is a big step. Big step. I, I'm I, I'm just skeptical on this story. I'll, I'll, I'll count me as skeptical here. All right, continue. Eight and a half foot alligator captured on the porch of a South Carolina home late at night while the family inside slept soundly, neighbors said. And here's the most terrifying thing about this story. This alligator apparently has been moving through the Palmetto Point subdivision for a year. (laughs) And they finally (laughs) tracked it down. How does an alligator roll through the suburbs for a year, Clay? I don't know. I don't know. This is the second time now that we've had alligators on the porch in South Carolina. I don't know how you're supposed to have a normal existence now. If you live in South Carolina and you know at any point, remember we had the alligator on the Animal Thunderdome in South Carolina that climbed the stairs. Right. Like you should never go out on your second floor patio and find an alligator there. I don't know what's going on. And again, this 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 rogue alligator has been for a year. Like how hard is it to catch an alligator? Like are kids I'm, I'm not really allowed disappointed. outside? Uh, I, I don't know what's happened, maybe some radioactive treatment, but it seems to me that the alligators of South Carolina have definitely gotten some sort of uh, advancement evolutionary-wise, and they're definitely starting to take out people. Gamecock, yeah, this, maybe this is what happens. Clemson wins the title, South Carolina <laughs> goes to the Final Four, and the alligators run amok. This is what happens. The apocalypse basically has arrived in South Carolina. It's all Florida has left. Finally, a golfer playing a course in South Africa had to stop with her party when the 14th hole turned out to be occupied by two venomous snakes doing battle. Kruger Sightings and Kara Trehearn said she and her party stopped on the 14th at the Leopard Creek Golf Course when they spotted the two Mambas, two Kobe's, battling in the manicured grass. Oh, Kobe's fighting to the death? Black Mambas? Kobe's fighting to the death. Black Mambas on a golf course battling one another. That's terrifying. That's not good. I mean, every time I go on a golf course and I hit my ball into the into out of the fairway, which is like 90% of my shots, I walk around looking for it, and then inevitably I think to myself, is it worth finding a $2 golf ball if it means that I get bitten by a rattlesnake in the process? And the answer is always no. So I can't even imagine if you get to a green, and then inevitably this would be one of the few times you actually have a birdie chance. And then you got a, the, the Mambas fighting. I mean, I, I don't even know. I, in general, it seems like a scary idea to play golf in Africa. You know, in America, they always have these animals running across the green. Like, the, I've seen bears. I've seen deer. Did you see the guy, by the way, who put the deer in the headlock at the Walmart? That's <laughs> yes. a guy. We need to get that guy on the show. Uh, that's a hero. True American hero putting the deer in the headlock. Uh, second hour coming up. Jeff Schwartz is going to join us. We're going to talk about the man who got away with murder because he choked his wife to death. He claimed with his gigantic penis. That really happened. This is Outkick the Coverage on Fox Sports Radio. Welcome back. Hour 2, Fox Sports Radio Studios, brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com for a free rate quote. As well, as always, remember, 
got a contest going on right now. I'll kick the coverage and visit Florida. And remember, I'm in Florida right now. Spectacular place this time of year. Have your chance to win a trip to the Coke Zero 400, powered by Coca-Cola, July 1st at Daytona International Speedway. To enter for your chance to win, visit foxsportsradio.com. And again, I am Clay Travis. I hope you guys are having a spectacular Wednesday. Going to be joined by Jeff Schwartz. He joins us every single Wednesday. Always fun. Former NFL offensive lineman here in a few minutes. But we've got news out in the NFL. The NFL changed a few different uh, aspects of their game. One that we talked about a little bit yesterday, they have cut back overtime in the NFL to 10 minutes from 15 minutes. I got to tell you this. The best overtime in all of sports, I believe, is college football overtime. I don't know why the NFL wouldn't just do exactly what college football does. Start possessions at the 25-yard line. The fantasy stats that would be rolled up would be extraordinary. And then just let teams go back and forth, maybe automatically in the NFL instead of waiting till after the second overtime like they do in college. Mandate going for two. I think the NFL... Overtime right now oftentimes feels way too devoid of energy. They've had a lot of games end in ties of late. And so I don't know why shortening it to 10 minutes is going to make it better. I would adopt the college football overtime rules. Any disagreement there around the around the horn? Would you guys think the NFL was more entertaining if they adopted the college football overtime rules? Start with you, Jason Martin. Uh, absolutely. It's something I've always said. And one of the things about overtime as it stands now, even with the 15 minutes now becoming 10, now it makes it easier for a team if they have ball control to get the ball first, go down, kick a field goal and give the team no time with 10 minutes to come back and try to tie the thing. But when you look at college overtime versus the NFL, another big thing is these guys have already played 60 minutes. That fifth quarter is usually horrible football because these guys are all so tired. If you shorten it, put these guys on whatever yard line it is, maybe it's not the 20 or the 25. Maybe you put it a little bit further back. Maybe the 40 in the NFL would be a little bit better because you got guys in the NFL who never miss field goals, even starting at midfield. And let both teams. I think the forty would be good because you're yeah, basically I in agree. scoring chances. If you you know get six yards on a play, you can kick a field goal from there. I think that would be uh, really entertaining football. I wish they would adopt college football, but maybe with the that's a good point. Maybe with the adjustment of start at the forty as opposed to the twenty five. Uh, Danny G and Justin, any disagreement there? Uh, not at all. I was actually just about to say the same thing. Jason said uh, the only thing that I don't like about the the college overtime is that I think it they start too close. Which I mean, I guess it makes sense for for college players, but I think you you gave a perfect uh, fix for that. The, the forty sounds good. Or how about midfield? How about at the fifty? Yeah, I mean, I think you could argue midfield. I mean, the problem is you might not get a scoring chance at midfield, right? If you get sacked, which maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe you don't need to necessarily have the drama of lining up for a field goal. But I like the strategy associated with it. When you have a guy lining up for a field goal and he's got to make it, you, then the other team gets the ball. And, yeah, if you started at the 50, I think you would frequently have neither team score. Yeah, that's, that's so the issue. I think, I, yeah, I, I, think that would be, I think that would be the challenge. If you start at the 40... I think it would be unlikely that both teams would miss a field goal because, you know, the team that that got the stop would be like, screw it, we're just going to run the ball three times and then we'll bring in our big leg kicker and let him bomb it through. The other change that went on, again, we're going to talk a little bit about this with Jeff Schwartz, touchdown celebrations. Snow Angels now allow, allowed, this is a group demonstrations and more are back. And uh, the details, uh, is this official release from the NFL that I've got on my screen right here, Jason Martin? It's a letter from Roger Goodell to the fans of the NFL. All right. So basically they are saying uh, that they are trying to uh, to have, you know, a lot of different conversations and they are relaxing their rules on celebrations to allow players more room to have fun after they make big plays. We know you love, this is from Roger Goodell, we know you love the spontaneous displays of emotion that come after a spectacular touchdown. Players have told us they want more freedom to be able to express themselves and celebrate their athletic achievements. Here are a few examples of celebrations that will be allowed after scores under the new policy. Using the football as a prop, celebrating on the ground, and group demonstrations where everybody uh, dances around. Here's what's fascinating, I think, about the uh, the whole no fun league uh, approximation that was assigned to the NFL. Again, those rules just coming down yesterday. I believe, and nobody ever talks about this, but I believe initially the reason why they put the celebration rules in was not to try to take the fun out of the game. It was because they believed, and I think this has probably been proven true with Cam Newton, that players who celebrated were more likely to be targets on the field because the defensive players felt like they were being shown up. 
And I think you've seen it with Cam Newton. I mean, Cam Newton, look, was celebrating, dancing after touchdowns, everything else. Remember, it was uh, Tennessee Titans players who complained back in the day. And then what's fascinating about that is it led this year, I think, to Cam Newton taking a lot of physical abuse. I think that guys on the defensive side of the ball feel like offensive players who score and then showboat in some sense, they're going to make even more of an effort to extract punishment than they normally would. And nobody talks about this in terms of the the context of the NFL games. I think this makes it more likely that you get personal fouls, everything else. I'm not opposed to celebrations, but I think this is the reason why they put the rule in was not necessarily to take away the fun from the game. It was to try to avoid the escalation after we saw guys like Terrell Owens with the football at the 50-yard line, after we saw, was it Joe Horn who pulled out the cell phone? phone. Yep. All these different things that were going on. You had a diff- an interesting question about where it was going to end. But also, I think, to me, the most interesting aspect of this is that it puts your target on your back even more so than there already is. Because Cam Newton, I believe 100%, was more targeted by NFL defenses because of the way he was celebrating the touchdowns that he was scoring with the Carolina Panthers. And this year, what would you see? Cam Newton coming out and saying, well, the refs aren't protecting me enough. Well, one reason that you had that bullet, you know, that, 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 that target on your back was because you're coming out and doing Superman celebrations, was because after every touchdown, you are doing a lot to draw attention to yourself as if you needed more attention. And I think NFL players resented it. Certainly, the Denver Broncos did in the Super Bowl. I think the number one story of the Super Bowl is that the way Cam Newton was playing motivated the Denver Bronco defense, and they said, you are not going to ridicule us and embarrass us on the national stage in front of 100 million people. And they played through the whistle and beyond, and then I think a lot of other teams took that into account and played against Cam Newton the same way. And I I think I'm correct in this. You guys can, can, can contrast me if I'm wrong. I think Cam Newton celebrating on the football field went down a lot in 2016 as opposed to what he was doing in 2015 because I think he got checked. He got regulated by the NFL defenses. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is just going to be a lot of fun, but I tend to think this is going to lead to more extracurricular activity outside of the whistle because guys feel like they're getting shown up when a team scores an offensive touchdown and then does a choreographed dance. Am I wrong here? Do you think this is possible? I think that's an interesting angle. It's not one that I had thought of. I always looked at it and thought they kind of made a rule where, look, there was a lot of forethought going into these celebrations. You mentioned Joe Horn. You mentioned Terrell Owens. Another thing Terrell Owens did, obviously, was pull a Sharpie out of his sock on Monday Night Football and sign the football. I think the football as a prop is one thing. When you have other props associated with it, then we've kind of gone a little bit too far, and that doesn't include Ezekiel Elliott jumping into a Salvation Army bucket, which I thought was fantastic this past year. So I think it was more that they had an idea where they wanted to curtail the circus aspect of it and then went too far. But I do think your point is valid. Uh, one reason that we didn't see Cam celebrate as much this year is because he didn't have as much to celebrate They weren't this year. as good. That's certainly true. But I think that that is – I never hear anybody talk about that. It's always like, oh, the NFL is just looking to stifle creativity. They hate having fun. It's the no fun league. I never hear anybody point out what I think was a substantial rationale. It was against taunting, right? Like, you're not going to put your hand behind the head, Deion Sanders style, and go into the end zone taunting a player – because it makes it more likely that those players are then going to take matters into their own hand and hit you after the whistle. It makes fights more likely. It makes the game get a little bit out of control for officiating. Now, I also think it's absurd that an official, I think, uh, that's been memorably ridiculed uh, by a variety of different comedians, but the idea that an official's got like a notepad watching to see how many pelvic thrusts you're allowed to do after the uh, after a touchdown is scored that's pretty ridiculous, right? It puts a lot of onus on officials to know what's an appropriate celebration, what's an inappropriate celebration. Do we really need officials standing around watching aggressively after touchdowns? But I do think in terms of the, the keeping the game clean and trying to avoid a lot of the uh, the cheap shots, a lot of the uh, extra hits and everything else, that's really the reason the rule was put in initially. I'm curious if the NFL will keep stats on this, whether that will change now in 2017, whether guys will get upset. Again, remember, the, the whole Cam Newton controversy with celebrating in the end zone didn't start because fans were upset. It started because players were upset. They said, look, we feel like this guy's showing us up. Is there a different standard for expected behavior from, for instance, quarterbacks than there might be running backs and wide receivers and tight ends? I think that's true. You know, I think people react differently if Rob Gronkowski is the one celebrating than they do if it's Tom Brady. 
I think for whatever reason, NFL defenses take offense when the general on the field, the quarterback, a Cam Newton, a Tom Brady, is celebrating, they think, excessively, and they don't take the same level of offense if it's Rob Gronkowski or if it's Adrian Peterson or if it's some big-time NFL wide receiver like Odell Beckham Jr., I think the different standards for expectation on the football field apply here. And certainly a lot of people believed that Cam Newton was running afoul of the rules. And I think it might have cost him a Super Bowl because it certainly motivated the Denver Broncos to play hard. And then we'll see what Cam Newton can do coming back in 2017. But there was certainly a lasting hangover from that performance in Super Bowl uh, in in 2015 that hung over into 2016 for Cam Newton. All right, Jeff Schwartz up next. We're going to join him. Should be uh, outstanding as it always is. This is Outkick the Coverage. We're going to ask him. We're going to ask him all about all sorts of stuff, including the celebration rule and also maybe Peter King's top 16 football teams. He's got out his power rankings. But we're also going to ask him whether or not if he was on the jury, he would have bought the defense of the guy who was accused of murder and managed to get off, no pun intended there, by using his gigantic penis as a defense this is how keep the coverage on fox sports radio fox sports radio studios great news there's a quick way you could save money switch to geico go to geico.com and in 15 minutes you could save 15 percent or more on car insurance we bring in my guy jeff schwartz now as we do every single wednesday former nfl offensive lineman member of the jewish sports hall of fame and also a guy that I was texting with yesterday saying, make sure you read up on this gigantic penis murder defense so we can talk about it tomorrow on the radio. And we'll get to that in a moment. But first, I start with an important question. Jeff Shorts, you have seen the video of the of the little girl who was attacked by the sea lion. Yeah. I have said that it's a, it's a must that we track down that sea lion and kill it because it can't be trusted anymore. Is that the right call or the wrong call? Um. I think I start with the sea line here. Look, the little girl uh, was sitting on the edge. I mean, he's just trying to get some food. He's trying to eat. He's trying to make, you know, he's trying to survive. You're a sea line apologist. Sea line apologist. Sea line apologist. I guess I am, but I, I don't think we got to kill the guy. He's just trying to, you know, as a, as, a, as a bigger gentleman who likes to get food. Now, I'm not eating other humans. I get I get the need, the quest for food all the time. I always think about it. This, this seal, excuse me, the sea line. What's the difference between a seal and a sea lion? I it's a fantastic question. I have no idea. I also asked, I don't understand why seals and sea lions are only on the West Coast. Like, wouldn't you think, oh, let's go to the Atlantic Ocean, too, if you were a seal or a sea lion? Maybe because the water temperature difference. But is there really that much water temperature difference between, like, there are cold parts of the Atlantic Ocean, too. Of course. Like Maine no, is cold. I, I don't know. I, I don't know the difference between them, but I don't think we have to hunt this guy out. Maybe we need to put him on trial. Go through the system. Go through the court system and see what happens. Here's the problem. Here's the problem that I see it, and this may be racist against seals and sea lions. I don't think you can tell one sea lion apart, so I think you'd have to just murder a whole passel of them to make sure you got the right guy. (laughs) Is that racist to say that I think all sea lions look the same? Is that racist (laughs) against sea lions? Um, I mean, in this day and age, it probably is. Seven years ago. You're probably right. You're probably right. I might. There's going to be the masses. There's going to be people with placards protesting because I was racist against sea lions outside the radio station tomorrow. Uh, we, uh, we're talking to Jeff Schwartz. A uh, couple of things I want to get into uh, before we get into the gigantic penis defense. Um, Warriors. I believe the Warriors are going to win this series in five games. I don't even think it's going to be close against the Cavs. If I am right, are the Warriors the greatest NBA team of all time? They would be 16-1 and one in the postseason. They would also have won 67 games in the regular season, and many of the games that they would have lost would have basically been voluntary losses because they were resting their guys. They have This is an amazing stat, Jeff. They have not lost a game with all four of their big four in. Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, obviously, Kevin Durant, and Steph Curry. All four of those guys playing. They have not lost a game with all four of those guys on the court since February the 4th, before the Super Bowl. I think the Cavs could beat them, but if the Cavs play, and I'm biased, I want the Cavs to win. I don't, I don't terribly like the Warriors. Um, but if, um, if, they, if the Cavs play the didn't game one and two, uh, they can do it. They play like they did the last two games. The Warriors are going to run them out of, the, out of the gym. And if you look at the Warriors, at least talent-wise, you know, they potentially have four Hall of Famers on their team. Um, they would be the most talented champion ever. Uh, best champion, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's different eras. It's hard to compare the basketball, you know, the Jordan play to the basketball now, but 
Um, the most talented team to ever win, that's, that's yes, they would be the most talented team to ever win. But I hope, the, I hope it goes seven. I hope the Cavs can summon what they did in game one and two against the Celtics um, and make this a series because the NBA needs it. I want it as a fan, um, and I'm rooting for the Cavs, so I hope they make it interesting. We're talking to Jeff Schwartz. We always hear that we want athletes to take less money and try to chase a championship. Kevin Durant did that, and now people are ripping him for taking less money and chasing a championship. Did you ever take less money in free agency than you could have made because you thought the team you were going to was better? No, the NFL is different because, look, Durant got what? He got $40 million less, $30 million less than he would have gotten in Oklahoma City. Um, but he's still, he's still getting $200 million. Um, and plus he has endorsement deals on the side and he's got his own shoe. Uh, you know, he's other ways to make up the money in the NFL. You might get one contract. I got one big contract. Um, and so you, you go to the money, uh, and very rarely do guys take less, you know, Tom Brady comes to mind as a guy who's taking less, but look, he's getting deals with Aston Martin with Ugg shoes. He's finding other ways for income. His wife makes more than him. So, you know, to him money, um, you know, getting the most for what he's worth is not, is not important to him. So there's certain guys can do it, but in the NFL, very rarely do guys take less money um, in their, you know, their, their second contract, their big contract. When you got your big contract, what was the biggest check you got? Like, did you take it to the bank and deposit it yourself or was it direct deposit? Yeah. The bonus checks are not, are not um, direct deposit. So I got a check for 1.6 after taxes. All right, you got a check for one point six million dollars. Where did you take that? That's pretty awesome. So I always think, like, where did you take that check? Were you single at the time, and where did you take that no, check to married. deposit it? No, I um, I've actually seen a buddy of mine who had more money in the check. I was, it's amazing. Um, what does that feel like to walk into a bank and have a check for one point six million dollars to deposit? Like, does, um, it, does the teller react at all? Because, I mean, usually people are like, oh, I'm going to deposit my $400 paycheck. I mean, you know, I'm going to withdraw $200. And then a dude just walks in with a $1.6 million check to deposit. I think I just put it into the ATM. <laughs> really? And did the, yeah. And then, but it takes many, it takes a couple of weeks to clear. Like, they Would it be wrong it to you right away. if I were a single guy and I got a check for $1.6 million, I would go around to all the different bank places and I would wait until I saw the hottest girl who's going to accept the check, and then I would go try to get her phone number when I was depositing the one point six million dollar check. Good play or oh, bad you'd, play? You would one hundred percent would get that that phone number. Right. I sent Why a would photo. You not? I sent a photo of of the bank statement to my wife, and she said something like, uh, "You know, I had one point six in the account." She said something like, "I have one point one thousand in my account." <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was pretty clever. <laughs> I it was pretty uh, clever. Yeah, no, that's not bad. I mean, again, we're talking to Jeff Schwartz, former NFL offensive lineman. Um, NFL celebration rule. The NFL celebration, I was just saying before you came on that I thought a big reason why Cam Newton took the beating that he took on the field this past year and also the beating that he took in the Super Bowl was because NFL defenses finally had enough of a guy who was playing quarterback that they thought was excessively celebrating in the end zone. Is there a different kind of standard for what's normal behavior in your experience on the on the field for a guy who might be a wide receiver or a tight end or a running back as opposed to a quarterback when it comes to scoring a touchdown? Like my theory is that NFL defenses are fine with a wide receiver like Odell Beckham Jr. running around and putting on a show because they kind of expect it. That's a diva behavior. Maybe also a Rob Gronkowski when he scores, people expect a huge show because he's a tight end. That's what they anticipate. But when Cam Newton scores, you don't anticipate your quarterback basically dancing like Cam Newton did, and he took the benefit and the brunt of all of the anger that ever, that rolled in from NFL defensive players over that. Have you seen it as an offensive lineman in the league, people reacting to celebrations like that? Oh, that's 100% accurate. I think there's a different standard uh, for the franchise quarterback. There's a different standard for how the president should act, right? I mean, I think we've lowered the bar for what um, <laughs> there used to you be. Know, we, you know, what we feel a president should act like. In the same way, for not we haven't lowered the bar for Cam, but as far as what quarterbacks, uh, you know, the kind of the attitude and and the way they carry themselves. Yes, there's a standard for that, and I think 100% agree that. Um, you know what in 2015 everything was going well Cam was dabbing and you know even if you look at something you take away the, you know the Denver game when guys are you know trying to take shots on him but you, know, you look what they did to Atlanta uh, in 2015 they're up by 30 points 
Uh, they're dancing on the sidelines. They're all they're taking team photos of themselves dabbing. And when they gave it back to him last year, they ran the score up on them at home with Julio Jones. He had 300 yards receiving. Um, you know, it's going to come back and, and bite you. But as far as the celebration, I'm, I'm so happy they went back to allowing guys to express some emotion because the game is super emotional. And to not be allowed to just have three, five seconds, seven seconds of fun after you score a touchdown is ridiculous to me. And I think everyone will enjoy this. This will, you know, might bring more fans back to the game. I know numbers were down last year as far as viewership. I think that has to do with the, with the, uh, with the election. But um, this is a great move by the NFL. We're going to go to trending. We'll bring back Jeff on the flip side. But first, let's go find out what's trending now. Welcome back. Fox Sports Radio Studios. Brought to you by Geico. What a great song. It's easy to save 15% or more on car insurance with Geico. Go to geico.com or call 800-947-AUTO. The only hard part, figuring out which way is easier. And with True Car, you can find out what other people in your area paid for the same car you're looking for and on average save over three grand off MSRP. Whether you're looking for a new or used car, visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Jeff Schwartz with us, uh, former NFL offensive lineman. Jeff, um, I also said that I think relaxing the celebration rules could lead to more like on the field shenanigans, whether it's late hits, everything else, because guys don't like being shown up. You agree or disagree with that idea? Uh, I disagree a little bit. I think that if it's just in the end zone after a touchdown, I think we understand that that's going to happen in part of the game. They, they said as part of the celebration, you know, the new, I guess the laxing of the, of the penalties that they're still going to call tauntings. They're still going to call any time a guy tries to show someone up. So I think you're not going to see as, as you know any more fights or any more animosity. I mean, guys already try to dance now. Um, you know, if you score a touchdown on offense, the you know the defenders are normally walking back to you know to go to the PAT. They're not standing there watching you do a group celebration. I think if you allow taunting, which I still think there's a there's a part of the game where that's allowed. Um, and should be allowed, that would lead to, to more fights. But if it's just guys after a touchdown doing a dirty bird in the end zone, uh, I don't think you're going to get any more fights than usual. NFL also changed overtime rules, dropped it from 15-minute overtime to a 10-minute overtime. Everybody on this show agrees that college football overtime is by far the best overtime in sports. I mean, maybe not counting sudden death and hockey, but basically college football gets it right. Now, college football, for those of you who've forgotten or don't remember, ball at 25-yard line. Each team gets an opportunity to score after two uh, rounds of overtimes. You have to go for two. We were saying maybe in the NFL you would need to start those possessions at the 40, but would you like to see college football overtime in the NFL as opposed to the existing overtime in the NFL? I'd rather the NFL go back to sudden death overtime. And just get it over with. Um, I don't want the college football system. What, what I, what, you know, it's the most fair, but it's a lot of plays. And uh, you know, you play enough, you play enough uh, football during during the uh, the regulation time. I really just go back to sudden death. It doesn't have to be fair. And you uh, you had 60 minutes to win the game. And you know, the way we do it now really devalues defense. It's almost like it doesn't matter, right? You want to, you know, each quarterback needs the ball. Well, how about your defense make a stop? Uh, and so I'm okay with it going back to sun death, which it won't. I mean, 10 minutes seems rather ridiculous. I think we'll have more ties. It's not going to solve any issues uh, that people have with overtime rules. And, and um, the college system to me is just too many plays. I mean, NFL's offenses are too efficient to start from the 20. What college is 25, right? Uh, yeah, college 25 yard yeah. line. You, you, you play forever if that happened. Uh, this is what everybody's been waiting for. This is what we texted about. How many straight men do you think have been texting about the gigantic penis murder defense? Not many. <laughs> I, I, I'm reading the story on the Daily Mail right now. It's remarkable. The Florida man who claimed his girlfriend choked to death during oral sex was found not guilty of second-degree murder Monday. Richard Patterson, 65, was acquitted of killing his 60-year-old girlfriend in 2015 after a week-long trial. During the trial, lawyers argued that Marquinez died accidentally while performing oral sex on him at her apartment because of his gigantic penis. In fact, to bolster their defense, Patterson's lawyers even filed a motion to show his penis to the jury. They did not to decide to do that because a medical expert testified choking during oral sex was unlikely. The defense reversed course. Judge never ruled on the request to put Patterson's member on display. Uh, and 
I don't even know what ends up happening, but this guy gets off, no pun intended, on the murder. Uh, your thoughts, Jeff Schwartz, if you were a member of the jury, would this have been a hung jury? Uh, 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 or, would, <laughs> or, and we're going to definitely win a Marconi for this segment, or would you have been skeptical of the man's claim? Um, the, the reading this story is, uh, um, they said that they argued about whether the sex organ must be in the best part about reading the story is the different ways they, they tried to find, uh, to use, you know, for penis, they tried to find different, like what, you know, they use sex organ, uh, male anatomy. Um, but they said that the, you know, part of the argument was if he had to show it in court, would it be erect or not? Um, and can, you ima- like, can you imagine him having to just be like, sir, uh, he'd have to, to perform. He'd have to, he'd have to, yeah. you know, like, yeah, um, that's a, that's an amazing I, thought to think of I think in front of the jury, the men, just standing there. I think all the men in the, in, in the, on the jury were probably so impressed that they laid, they let him get off. I have to think there's no, you know, there's no, you, know, you can have some jealousy of course, but. Um, if I was on the jury and he was like, this is, this is what happened. I'm telling you, this is what happened. And then he presented the organ into, into evidence. Um, I don't know. I rest I my case. Be, I don't know how I, can you imagine just, if he just said, I flop, he just flopped it on the, on like, made an actual noise on the desk. And he's like, this is, this is what, this is what happened. I mean, you have to acquit the guy. There's no way, there's no other way to say it. It's a penis drop as opposed to a mic drop. It's like, uh, could, should, how could you stand up? And of course his name is Jason Martin's pointing out is Richard. Can you imagine going in to meet with your attorney and you're like, you're facing the rest of your life in prison and you're like, I, look, here's my, here's my theory on what happened. My penis is just too gigantic. Like, did the defense attorney have to look at his penis? Like, I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking if I'm going to make the case, imagine, imagine that the, the, the jury's like shock and dismay. If the guy argues that the reason why he uh, why he got off again, no pun intended, was for the gigantic penis, and then the the prosecution like calls his bluff. It's like when OJ had to try on the glove, and then he drops yeah. his trousers, and he's just uh, got a tiny penis, and then everybody's like, "Well, he definitely did it." Like that would be the worst possible scenario, right? So I think the defense attorney had to be like, "Okay, well, let me see your penis." You know, I'm gonna have to. If we're gonna make, if we're gonna, if you're gonna have me stand up and argue that your gigantic, gigantic penis choked this woman to death, then you're gonna have to reveal your penis to me. And that's gotta be an uncomfortable meeting with your lawyer. He's billing, billable hour there. He's like, uh, what did you do today? Reviewed client's penis uh, to determine whether or not it was a sufficient size to to argue that his wife that his wife choked to death on it. Um, And by the way, yeah, unbelievable that that worked for the jury. Did, did, do you think that that as a defense attorney is is preparing his motion to show the the male organ, he's just laughing to himself like I went to law school for three years, miserable to just talk about my client's sex organ, see how big it is. I, What's also, more ridiculous? Guy, I went to law school for three years uh, to end up talking on sports talk radio about the guy with the gigantic penis who got off for murder. I think that might be even more ridiculous than the defense attorney who at least is using his law degree to argue that the penis is too gigantic. And have you seen the picture of the guy? I just, it's not what yes. I pictured. What did you picture? I don't know. I don't know what I, I don't know what I thought it'd be, but I didn't realize he's 65 either. Did Poor you? Gentleman. So, yeah, he's an older older gentleman. Tying in, since we're talking about penises, did you also see this story? I'm curious if you guys think this is racist. Um, there was a guy, a black, this is true, this is from the Daily Mail, black man who underwent penis transplant will have it tattooed because the donor was white. First of all, black guy who happens to get a white guy's penis, unfortunate draw for him, right? Um, and uh, But this is this is a true story. Surgeons have revealed the man who received the world's third successful penis transplant is black, but his penis is white. It means the 40-year-old patient will have to <laughs> – uh, I don't know. I mean, also, when you're getting a penis transplant, like, do you get to review the penis beforehand and be like, yeah, I'll take that one? Like, do they bring do they bring out a huge, like, row of penises and you're like, oh, I think that one look, like has nice uh, workability or whatever? It means the 40-year-old patient will have to undergo extensive medical tattooing later this year to color correct the penis he received. First of all, why couldn't he have just gotten a black penis? Secondly, is it racist – to want your penis to be the same color as you. I don't know. If a white guy got a black man's penis, which, by the way, better draw there for him, but would it mean that he would, like, if he got it colored white, would not everybody be like, oh, this guy's racist. More white privilege. Even a black man's penis is getting covered. You know, it's like uh, the tattooing procedure will take place at the end of this year, according to the team of South African surgeons who attach the penis in a nearly 10-hour surgery. 
But first, well, he'll be able to have he'll be able to have sex. The patient who is unnamed for ethical reasons, which is hysterical, lost his penis due to complications from a traditional circumcision. By the way, worst circumcision ever. Wait, what what, what happened? Age is he getting a circumcision at? Um, a grown man uh, who decides to get a circumcision is a questionable God. man anyway. But I to couldn't get... even watch my son's breasts. Oh God! I just, oh. This, this, and it was he was seven days old when that happened. Um, Okay, so many questions here. So when you fill out, like, a, a donor organ form, do you have to, like, check that you'll give up your, your manhood as part of it? Like, I don't understand oh, that's how the a great question. works to where, to where you just are, you, you know, you pass away, and then there's, like, okay, well, here's a good-looking penis. Let's that is a fantastic else. question. Do I if, – and by the way, if you get your penis rejected as an organ donor, is that, like, the worst rejection of all? You're dead, so you don't realize it. But do they just strip you down naked, and they're like, oh, this guy's penis is totally – we can't use this for a transplant. This will be, be an insult to put this penis on another man like i don't know it's a great question i'm a donor have i have i agreed to give up my penis like my kidney if i died today in a traffic accident somebody could take my kidney could they also just take my penis i don't know that's a great question (laughs) is it like and you know is it like is it like when you know when 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 you get your your boobs done where you just flip through the book and you see like the boobs you want you just flip through a book of dead guys penises just choose like which one you want i just so many i just it's so many questions here how do you why are you getting circumcised so late in life? There's just so many questions. I, I also, again, the the tattoo. I don't. I don't know how much time it takes to tattoo a penis. I've never gotten a tattoo. It seems like it would be the, as if you already haven't had enough issues. Like you already had to have your penis amputated because of circumcision, and then you got a you're a black guy and you got a white man's penis in South Africa. Which, by the way. Awful odds, right? Isn't South Africa, South Africa like 85% black? So it's a minority white guy anyway. Black guy getting a white guy's penis. A lot of people out there are like black guys. Like, I don't want a white guy's penis. And then, the, <laughs> and then you decide that you're going to have to get it tattooed. Like, that seems like it would be incredibly painful on top of it. But it, it, would it be a good pickup line, though, if you met a lady and, you, and you're talking about just, you know, life stories? You're like, yeah, I have a white penis. Like, I think she would want to see that. It could be. Oh, I more. mean. It would mean that a black, a white guy could literally say, "I have a black man's penis." That would be an what unbelievable lie. Got, what if someone got McNair's? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's Steve, really hitting the home run. If you don't know, Steve McNair has the largest penis in the history of pro sports. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think yeah, that's like it's not like hitting a home run. That's like getting a grand slam. I, I don't even know what would have to happen there. First of all, I mean, you, you, I don't know if the guy could walk upright. I mean, you have to have like a strong back to even carry that thing around. <laughs> Might have to get a penis reduction study, study after uh, after that. Uh, all right, uh, Jeff Schwartz, uh, open phone horrible. lines now. <laughs> yeah, uh, fun as always. Uh, that is Jeff Schwartz, uh, the most famous Jewish man to ever play football other than his brother. Uh, Mitch, I am Clay Travis. This is Outkick the Coverage, and we are penis experts here on Fox Sports Radio. Would have been an incredible play there to come back with short tort man. Don't necessarily want to tell you how to do your job, Danny G, but you missed an opportunity there. Unless I'm missing one of these. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio Studios. Great news. Quick way you could save money. Switch to Geico. Go to Geico.com and in 15 minutes you could save 15% or more on car insurance. Jason Martin, you guys were playing a game last segment. Uh, yes, indeed, we were. Clay, there have been many milestones throughout history. Where were you when the Berlin Wall came down? Where were you when the San Francisco earthquake hit during the World Series on October 17, 1989? Where were you when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon? And now, a new question. Where were you when Clay Travis hit 51? He scored 51. During the break before Jeff Schwartz came on, the guys out in L.A. came to me privately and asked over under 35 how many times you would use the word penis over the next <laughs> two seconds. just mispronounce it there? What are you talking say about? Penis. Can you say penis? Uh, yes. That's what you I just, said, right? Did you, so Danny G and Justin, can you agree that that was really weird the way he said it? <laughs> kind of. It's a weird how I said it. Here's the deal. The over under was 35, and I said, you know what? I think that's a good number. So I pushed it 35. You Holy put, first cow. of all, hold on, hold on. How much of a pussy willow can you be if the over <laughs> under is set at 35 and you pushed? You didn't even take one side or the other? Well, my whole point was, it was 35 like, felt It's like so saying egregious. that we had John Campbell on earlier and he's like, oh, the over under in the Cavs Warriors game is going to be 225. And you're like, 
Yeah, you know what? I think that's about right. I'm going to push. <laughs> you can't push on 35. You can push on, like, how many more championships is LeBron James going to get over under one? Okay, I think one's probably the right number. You can't push on 35. You have well, to take po- one side or the, the other. I think the that's po- the exactly right number. You're the worst gambler of all no, time. No, no, no. The whole point was 35 felt so egregious. I thought the joke was me saying that's a good number because it felt so ridiculous. It was not. You hit 51 penis mentions. During that one segment, you that were was, saying that the was word not penis. Even Kobe's See, I, that was Will yeah, so he, weirdly. He says why do penis. you have an accent when you say the yeah? What's the deal with Jason Martin can't say the word penis? I thought well, the weird part was when Jason on the talkback told us, "I'm going to push on the penis." <laughs> What in the world? Why does he have an accent on using the word penis? Why can he not use it right? I'm saying it. Is this what happens if you don't have sex wow. for six years? You can't even use the male genital organ correctly in a sense? <laughs> by the way, by the way, Clay, you are in rare air right now. You just hit 71. That is Kobe country, my friend. <laughs> Going for 80. What did Kobe get? 81? 83, right? Or no, 81. Yeah, I'm serious. Like, then Justin says during the break, that's a Fox Sports Radio record. I'm like, no, that's a Brazzers record. Like, Brazzers has never hit 51 <laughs> mentions in a 20-minute 20, 20 span of the word penis. That's better. You finally okay, said it correctly. I had to I, stop and try, I guess. Uh, I, I'm going around the horn here. I really am kind of fascinated by this story about this South African dude, the black guy who got the white guy's penis. Again, rough draw for him. But isn't it racist to get your penis the same color as you? Like, I think that getting the tattoo, if a white guy got a black guy's penis and then went back and made it white, everybody would be like, this is like, uh, what's, what's the, they would be like, this is, uh, this is like modern. And it, I guarantee you, it would be a huge controversy. It would be like a uh, reverse blackface, right? You're white facing a black man's penis. I got, is it racist or not racist to insist that your penis be the same color? What do you think? Jason Martin, racist or not racist for the guy with the penis transplant to insist on his penis being the same color? Boy, the questions being asked on this show today. <laughs> uh, 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 not racist. Not racist. D- Danny G and Justin, racist or not racist? Can't wait for my girlfriend to ask me how my day went at the studio. <laughs> <laughs> we got to be over 75 now, by the yeah. way. Don't dodge the question. <laughs> racist or not racist? Yeah, Justin, don't dodge the question not racist i think it might be racist open phone lines 877-996-6369 is it racist for the black man who got a white man's penis to want it to be black open phone lines your calls i'm clay travis how much time do we have left here before the show's canceled (laughs) (laughs) ironically 51 seconds (laughs) uh one of the greatest segments in the history of radio just has taken place. You need to go download the podcast. You'd be glad to hear it all. Uh, you can count and make sure these uh, knuckleheads did not screw up my uh, my Kobe Bryant s performance as I use the word penis. You're on your last uh, thirty seconds of your career right now. Uh, yeah, the last thirty seconds of my career. Uh, final hour. Final hour, pivoting to a large extent. Uh, we are going to have Jason Whitlock uh, with us. He's waking up early on the West Coast for us to talk about politics sports and more what an incredible transition this is but first we'll take your calls on whether or not it's racist for a black man to get a white man's penis and insist that it become black i'm clay travis asking the hard questions no pun intended here on outkick the coverage on fox sports radio welcome back fox sports radio studios brought to you by geico 15 minutes could save you 15 percent or more on car insurance visit geico.com for a free rate quote as well Let's see what else we got here. Your car's needs now come with a reward. With the AutoZone Rewards program, spend $20 five times and earn a $20 reward. So sign up today. Get in the zone. AutoZone. Going to be joined by Jason Whitlock here in a little bit. And I think you guys are really going to want to hear what Whitlock has to say as we prove that we can cover the most ground of any sports show in America by moving from penis transplant talk to the challenges of race in America in the 21st century. Go download the podcast if you're curious, you're just waking up and you're like, what in the world's Clay Travis talking about? You never know exactly what the responses are going to be or what kind of show you're going to get here. But CeCe is upset. He's KD for life. He just sent me a message. Not even 8 a.m. and penises? Done with you. Is it like drinking? Can you not use the word penis early in the morning? Have I violated some unwritten code? Is it too early in the morning to use the word penis going around the horn? Jason Martin, what do you think? 
No. Good riddance to that dude if he if he's <laughs> going to bounce on that. He, you should know what you're getting into if you get to this show. No doubt. What about you, Danny G and uh, and uh, Justin? Too early or not? Yeah, yeah. I think so personally. I mean, I like I like the way Jeff did it. Je- Jeff did it kind of classy <laughs> with his penis. Yeah, I like Jeff did it classy. You, you can't even say that. I don't know. You have the worst. Act. I I have never been more uncomfortable hearing another man mispronounce a word than your inability, Jason Martin, to use the word penis correctly. I don't know what accent you're using, but it sounds like the kind of accent somebody would use in deliverance right before they rape somebody on a boat trip. I don't know. I don't know what accent it is, but I am terrified right now. I'm glad that I'm in Florida and not in the same studio with you because I would be really nervous right now. You, I didn't know I had an accent when I said the word penis. You don't when you actually focus on it, but when you normally say <laughs> I don't it, want to focus it makes on me penis. so uncomfortable. The way you say it, the way, I, I, it, make, it almost gives me chills. Like all 50 states right now, there are people who are so uncomfortable because of the way you, you can't say the word correctly. Uh, anyway. I, oh, anyway, I'll work on it. You need to stand in front of the mirror and make some decisions about your life, beginning with how do how, how can I say the word penis and not sound like I'm going to rape somebody on a West Virginia river. <laughs> That's what you need to focus on. Other news: Ah, oh, the Cavs won. Like everybody knew they were going to win. People are like, why well, aren't you talking about sports right now? Well, the Cavs won. The Cavs won. Like everybody knew they were going to win. LeBron was okay. Kyrie Irving was really good. Cavs and the Warriors are going to play. The Warriors are going to win in five. Everybody's going to be like, oh, the NBA Finals is so exciting. I can't wait for them. And the NBA Finals is going to show up. And then the Cavs are going to lose in five games. The Warriors are going to win in five. They're going to be the best basketball team of all time, in my humble opinion. Also, game seven coming up tomorrow between the Penguins and the Ottawa Senators. Nashville Predators already sitting there in the playoffs waiting. We talked about gambling with John Campbell at Odd Shark. We talked about everything with Jeff Schwartz, new NFL rules, uh, the 10 minute overtime pl- uh, period, as well as allowing celebrations. And uh, let's, uh, let's go to the phones. And I have no idea how this is going to go, but it seems like it could go incredibly well or incredibly badly. I don't think I've given out the phone numbers so far today. 877-996-6369. Did I get the phone number right? I think I did. Uh, 877-996-6369. Let's go to AJ in Nashville. AJ, what's up? How are we doing, Clay? Uh, I'm outstanding. Awesome, awesome. So, as a black male, I normally don't get triggered for things. But the only reason, the only way I would ever be triggered is for black penis appropriation <laughs> black so, penis appropriation is unacceptable so if you you are a black man if you got a white man's penis how upset would you be i'd be hella triggered i would be <laughs> triggered beyond beyond all reasonable doubt i would be triggered i would i would be suing people i would be trying to get medical malpractice claims i would be doing everything because I didn't sign up for a white penis. I was born black. Like that's like getting a white vagina if you're transgender. Like what would with someone with a with someone with a white vagina if they were black transgender be okay with that? I don't think so. I don't it's a really complicated question. I don't know what's going on in the transgender community. So you would have surgery to get a white penis turned black like this guy is. I would I would I would paint it. I would do whatever. Think about a girl going down there and being like, Whoa, what's going on here? Uh, I, again, I, I think thanks for the call, AJ. Uh, AJ calling in saying he'd be triggered, he'd be microaggressed. I think that's fair. If you were a black man and you suddenly found out that you had a white man's penis, that might be triggering. That might be microaggressing. I don't think there's any doubt. Fantastic question. Eight seven seven nine nine six six three six nine. If you're wondering where all this spiraled out of, there has been a successful penis transplant in South Africa. You're waking up right now and you're like, man, will medical marvels never cease? This is the third successful penis transplant. Surgeons have revealed the man who received the world's third successful penis transplant is black, but his penis is white. It means the 40-year-old patient will have to undergo, Say they say it will have to, like he doesn't have to, he could just have a white penis, could be like an albino penis, Uh, will have to undergo extensive medical tattooing later this year to color correct the penis he received. By the way, speaking of albinos, This is the most remarkable story I've seen in a long time. Did you know that albinos 
in many African countries are considered good luck and they get kidnapped and killed for their albinoness. I'm not making this up. New York Times, I was reading the other day, like you think it's rough in America today. If you're an albino in Africa, you're considered good luck and you're worth so much dead that people just kidnap albinos and then use like their albinoness. I don't know what exactly it is to try and like ward off evil spirits. I couldn't believe this. I was like, what year is this? People who are albinos aren't comfortable like walking the streets of Africa because due to black magic, they are worth so much dead. As I'm not making this story up. Somebody can Google it and verify it. But it was in the New York Times. I read it and I was like, I, th- what? this is unbelievable. I, I, albino lives matter, I think. I would think so. Not in Africa. Uh, Jason Martin, what do I need to know here? What do you need to I know think, about what? Do we have any calls? Is there anything yeah, I need to I'm, know I'm about? I'm the... screening them right now. There are a couple of calls. Rob in Pittsburgh, if you want to go to him. Okay, Rob in Pittsburgh. What's up, Rob? Yeah, I love the show. The conversation about penis has been entertaining, but I have to tell you, driving to daycare with my twin two-year-old girls, and I keep thinking to myself, what are they going to talk about at daycare today, and what kind of <laughs> blowback am I going to get for this? It's been hysterical, but I'm like, wow. Well, the positive <laughs> is... You. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to make your twin two year old daughters uh, driving to daycare even more entertaining. You never know what a kid's going to say. Like, I used to drive my two year old at the time to daycare every morning. And when I would drive into morning uh, traffic, it would drive me insane, like sitting in morning traffic. And so every time I would get stuck at a traffic light, I would say, uh, and, and, and I would say, effing, effing, can I say this? Effing, damn it. And I, can I say that? I think I can say that. Um, And so I said it. So anyway, I don't think he got dropped. And so I would say that. And my kid was two years old. And then there was a holiday. My wife was working as a guidance counselor at a local high school. And so she just tried to drive him to school one day. And she's driving him to school as a two-year-old. And he's sitting in the back. And she pulls up at a red light. um, And and my two-year-old says in the background, effing damn it. And my wife says, what did you say? And he said, I said, effing damn it. And she said, where did you hear that? And she said, well, and, and my two-year-old said, well, daddy, and it's unbelievable that he had learned when I would use this phrase. He said, daddy says, effing damn it, whenever the light is green, but there's a car stopped in front of him trying to turn and he can't get around them. I mean, I think my kid, my nine-year-old now, he's basically a genius. I mean, I'm not kidding about this. this kid's a genius. But the fact that he was able to follow as a two-year-old in the back seat, my thought process is so well that he could correctly apply my curse words when my wife drove the car, made up for the fact that I had been cursing with my two-year-old in the car, teaching him bad words. So I hope things go well for your two-year-olds in Pittsburgh. That's the hope anyway. Um, Okay, Jason Whitlock is going to join us. If you wonder about the range that a show can have, the reason why OutKick is dominating across the landscape is because we can go from the incredibly juvenile to the incredibly in- intelligent, literally in the snap of the fingers. And Jason Martin is, is going, sorry, Jason Whitlock is going to join us here momentarily. You're going to want to listen to this at Whitlock Jason on Twitter. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to dive into a lot of the big issues of the day, in particular, the way that uh, the way that ESPN and sports media in general has been covering Colin Kaepernick. Is it fair or foul? Does it make sense? Or is it out of bounds? Is there bias involved? Jason Whitlock from Speak for Yourself. Also, again, you can follow him on Twitter at Whitlock Jason. I haven't even been able to check my mentions here of late, but I'm sure they are extraordinary. And again, if you are getting up right now and you're waking up and you're like, man, I hate my job, and there's probably a lot of you thinking that, and you're thinking to yourself, man, I want to be entertained at work today. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, take it from me, go download the podcast, listen to the first two hours of this show today, and you will be entertained beyond measure, especially the second hour where things went completely off the rails. Okay, uh, Jason, do we want to take any more calls, or should we go to break to get ready for the Whitlock interview? figure we need to go to break we actually like i took a couple of calls that we're not going to put on the air um ones that i don't know if they were just nervous because of the subject matter but they they couldn't get their points out particularly well this is this is kind of galvanized the whole country the whole what do we do? listening all audience. 50 states reacting to the show uh by the way our guy uh cc 
who wrote in and he was triggered by my use of the word penis before 8 a.m. He said you can't use the word penis till afternoon. <laughs> So well, after that coffee, that, that is actually a really funny, uh, actually a really funny response. All right. Uh, Jason Whitlock up next at Whitlock Jason on Twitter. I am Clay Travis. You're listening to Outkeep the Coverage on Fox Sports Radio. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio studios. Great news. Quick way you could save money. Switch to Geico. Go to Geico.com. And in 15 minutes, you could save 15% or more on car insurance. Join now by my guy, Jason Whitlock at Whitlock Jason on Twitter. You and I talk pretty frequently, and you heard this idea for a column before I wrote it. Most covered free agents in sports media. I ranked them thusly. LeBron, Peyton Manning, Brett Favre, Kevin Durant. Some people have said I should have included A-Rod. Let's include him. And then right after it, Colin Kaepernick. First five all first ballot Hall of Famers, if you give a little bit of a nod, away from the Colin Kaepernick, uh, I mean, sorry, from the A-Rod potential ped use why is Colin Kaepernick being covered like he is now, Jason? Because he's the biggest political football we've ever seen in sports. He's dwarfed Tim Tebow. I thought the Tim Tebow circus was the biggest thing I'd ever seen. Uh, this is far bigger than Tim Tebow. You now have a Seattle uh, city councilwoman who acknowledges, I don't know anything about football, but the Seahawks should sign Kaepernick. <laughs> Amazing line. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm just sitting here going, if I were Pete Carroll, Paul Allen, any NFL coach, it's just like, if you sign this guy, now there are city council people who are acknowledging they don't know what the hell they're talking about that will have a strong opinion about what you do with that quarterback. There's supposed to be a protest. Uh, I think today uh, at NFL headquarters uh, of Kaepernick supporters uh, protesting the NFL not signing this guy. This is crazy, man. It, It is wild. And you said on Speak for Yourself, I saw this on Monday, that you're actually starting to feel sorry for Colin Kaepernick because all the people who are advocating for him, most of whom are not actually sports fans, are, in your opinion, making it more difficult for him to get signed because they're just reinforcing whatever thoughts coaches might have about what a circus signing him would be. Yeah, I think that Colin uh, not being, you know, the the media is, oh, he's so thoughtful and his position so articulate. The more this plays out, the more it just comes off like this guy is completely clueless. When he started this, he had zero idea that it could lead to this. He had zero idea that people that, because take the city councilwoman in Seattle. She don't know Kaepernick. She doesn't care about Kaepernick. She's probably smart enough to know that she's hurting his chances of being signed by Seattle. But. It's a nice tool to get her in the headlines and drum up support and relevancy for her. She's using Kaepernick, and so are a bunch of other people. And so it makes me feel sorry for this guy is so far out over his skis, and he's being used by people that he could never imagine. And some of these people are, you know, I I don't think he's figured it out. They're he thinks they're friends of his, the Sean King over Twitter and things like that. He he thinks this guy's really got his back. And Sean King is just looking out for Sean King and using Kaepernick to elevate himself. He's got bad advice from people who don't care about it. Look, I'm, fr- I'm friendly and have a great deal of respect for Dr. Harry Edwards. He's giving Kaepernick bad advice. He's using Kaepernick to elevate himself. Colin Kaepernick is being used by a multitude of people, uh, and I feel sorry for him. What do you think about the comparisons between Colin Kaepernick and Muhammad Ali? (laughs) I mean, look, Muhammad Ali, at the height of his career, sat out for three years and fought the government over his draft status and being inducted into the Army. Three years. Colin Kaepernick couldn't make it a few months before he announced 
Uh, I'm not going to kneel anymore, or had it leaked that he's not going to kneel anymore. Uh, Colin Kaepernick got involved with this because he was bitter about losing his starting job because, and again, I, I don't say this maliciously, he has some identity issues based on his upbringing. Uh, he is mixed race. Both of his parents uh, walked away from him. He was raised by a wonderful uh, suburban couple in Milwaukee. Uh, and then he walks into, and he's living in this time that is so racialized and so racially divided and social media. And he did this. This was his black moment. This was... It's like, hey, I'm not going to be the great football player I thought I was going to be. Let me try to clean up my identity issues and have the blackest moment I can have. And so I'm going to protest along with Black Lives Matter. That's the thing to do. Everybody's doing it. Look how popular you are over Twitter and Instagram when you do it. It it just wasn't thought out. And it's like he doesn't understand his place in American society as a professional athlete that was a quarterback. Uh, it, it's, look, Muhammad Ali was back. Look, the Nation of Islam was polarizing and revolutionary and controversial. Uh, there was some kernels of substance uh, to the Nation of Islam, and Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali's advisors were really smart uh intellectual people again misguided religion that was uh clearly uh racist but again there were kernels of substance uh particularly as it related to black pride and black self determination uh Muhammad Ali was standing on a foundation of substance Colin Kaepernick is standing on Twitter uh, it, it, there's just no comparison between Colin Kaepernick and Muhammad Ali. We're talking to uh, Jason Whitlock at Whitlock Jason on Twitter. Go follow him there. This is I want to read from this Seattle council member statement. And this woman is a socialist. And you mentioned the fact that she says she's not a football expert, but I want to get your take on this. I'm not a football expert. Well, she begins by saying, I'm writing to convey Colin Kaepernick should be welcome in Seattle and to encourage you to take the opportunity to sign him as the Seahawks' backup quarterback. This is a letter sent to Pete Carroll and owner Paul Allen. I am not a football expert, she continues, but everything I've read strongly suggests the only reason a player with Kaepernick's skills is still a free agent is because of the backlash against his courageous leadership last year against racism, brutality, and discrimination. Okay. Is it courageous in your mind, Jason Whitlock, to come out against racism, brutality, and discrimination? Is there a really strong counter-argument out there against that is for racism, brutality, and discrimination? I get your point. But what she's arguing is by doing that, he opened himself up to critics. Uh, And so there is some courage in taking some public stance that opens you up to be analyzed and criticized uh, publicly. But I I do get your point. I I think in 2017, most people publicly, not where they really are, but publicly, most people are against discrimination, police brutality, and whatever. Now, they may be in their hearts for discrimination and all that, but publicly, yeah, you're right. Most people are against those things. And would you know like to virtue signal that they're against those things and they stand for all the right things, and so you know Colin Kaepernick did not uh, carve some new path that no one else was on. Jason Whitlock with us. I'm going to take a break here. We're going to go to trending. He's going to be with us on the flip side as well. But first, let's go to trending now. Welcome back. Fox Sports Radio Studios brought to you by GEICO. It's easy to save 15% or more on car insurance with GEICO. Go to GEICO.com or call 800-947-AUTO. The only hard part, figuring out which way is easier. 
as well as with True Car, you can find out what other people in your area paid for the same car you're looking for and on average save over three grand off MSRP. Whether you're looking for a new or used car, visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. You have written recently two editorials for the Wall Street Journal, massively read, massively distributed, very influential. What has that experience been like for you? Uh, well, I mean, I, you know, I was a columnist at the Kansas City Star for 16 years. Uh, and obviously the Wall Street Journal is a bigger platform than the Kansas City Star. But, you know, the columns I wrote in Kansas City were high impact and would take off, you know, nationally or whatever. So it's been great. It's an honor to write at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you know, the people that matter uh, read the Wall Street Journal. And so it's good to have a voice in in that platform. Uh, so it's been good. How much do you miss writing? Uh, not as much because I've been writing here lately, <laughs> but uh, I miss it a lot. I, I mean, that's been a big part of my identity and brand and who I am. Uh, I think it's a great vehicle to um, – length extend my brand and uh promote the television work that i do uh you know i i miss writing regularly and so i'm glad the wall street journal is giving me an opportunity you're part of one of the smartest television shows out there in the world of sports speak for yourself how challenging is television compared to writing in particular in this age when everything is so hypersensitive and also everything is so hyper social how much of a challenge is it how much do you enjoy it uh, a challenge, you know, the actual doing of television isn't the challenge. You know, it's, it's relatively easy. Uh, you know, I, I think the challenge is, you know, we're at a unique time in media history. And so there's a lot of discussion and debate about, you know, what's the proper thing to do. Uh, and, you know, how do you handle the Colin Kaepernick issues? Do you talk about it or do you just talk X's and O's? Uh, you know, my entire career has been built on the time we're living in right now. Things have changed in the sports media landscape and t- because things have changed in American society. It's not just Trump. It was President Obama got this ball rolling to where everything is politicized and the sports world is politicized and the social impact of sports is far more discussable, far more entertaining. And the public now looks at sports as a part of the rest of our society. And, you know, that's what my career has been built on. Uh, And so, you know, right now we're having this stick to sports debate where, you know, ESPN has clearly decided after some analysis that, uh, nope, no one's going to stick to sports. It's foolish to think that uh, you can just stick to sports. You know, I've never been, you know, since I, I started writing a column in 1994, I've never been a stick to sports guy. Uh, and so, you know, this, where we're at right now in this time fits perfectly into what I do and have been doing my entire career. Uh, it's just making sure everybody else is comfortable with it and, and, you know, understands what I'm doing. Jason, if you're not just going to stick to sports, and I think that's a very good point because sometimes people say stick to sports. I think what people object to is not when people leave the sports arena, I think it's when you leave the sports arena and you're not being fair to the way that people feel politically, right? You're not talking about things in a way that directly connects to sports, even if it's not sticking to sports and or you're not giving a balanced equation. You're choosing one side or the other. How do you in your in this 21st century mess that is modern day media decide when is fair and when is not fair to analyze things in a, in a perspective beyond sports? Well, I mean, I think the first thing I try to do is make sure it's connected to sports. 
uh, and that there's a clear connection to sports. I can remember years ago, uh, I wrote a piece for Playboy magazine about mass incarceration and America's drug war. But I did it by telling the story through the work Jim Brown was doing in Los Angeles with his Amera I Can program. Jim Brown, greatest football player, greatest running back uh, of all time, and his work here in Los Angeles was the jumping off point to tell a story about mass incarceration. This was for Playboy magazine. I wasn't restricted by Playboy magazine to have some sports connection. But because my brand is that of a sports writer, I wanted it to be connected to sports. Uh, And so what I think we've experienced here in in the media of late, and particularly in the sports media and some of the things that ESPN has done, sometimes people can't see the connection at all. It has no connection to sports. And I think a lot of times it's told from a point of view that only one side is right about these issues. Only one side, only one point of view is appropriate uh, to be examined on certain issues or to be represented on certain issues. And there, there's always more than one side to every story. And then I also think, again, because th- there's no clear understanding by the new people that have been given major platforms or given a voice in the blogosphere or over Twitter or whatever, They have no connection to the sports world, so they have no real understanding of the sports world. Sports culture is conservative, not in a political way, but it is conservative. And so when you look at the hardcore base of fans that your sports talk radio show, my column and newspapers or whatever, who we're actually speaking to, We're speaking to conservative sports fans. And if you come at them with a point of view that is far left-wing, they're wondering, hey, what the hell is going on here? This isn't consistent with sports culture. And so, again, so much of sports is tied to patriotism. And this is what, again, I go back to Colin Kaepernick, when he didn't even really understand. Why is he getting paid $20 million? Because Pete Rozelle was smart enough to, you know, if we connect football to Americana and patriotism and the military and train people to think of going to a football game and watching football and celebrating football is damn near as patriotic as joining the military, that's what helped football jump over baseball and become this powerful force in American television. And that's why Colin Kaepernick was making $18, $19 million a year. And so when he took that knee, he was upsetting the television product. (laughs) He was off script. He went rogue on the script because all it is is a television show. Football is a TV show, and he broke from the script. Everybody's supposed to play the role. We're here celebrating America and competing in football, and sports fans have bought into this to such a point that I can make $18, $19 million for playing quarterback even though I'm not that good. You break script, they'll get a new actor to play your role. That's what's going on with Kaepernick. Fascinating stuff here. Jason Whitlock, a couple more minutes he's going to hang with us, and I'm going to react and let you guys react as well. I am Clay Travis. You're listening to Outkick the Coverage. So much range on today's show. you got to go download the podcast. It's been pretty fantastic. More with a couple of minutes with Whitlock here, then we'll react. I'm Clay Travis, and this is Outkick the Coverage on Fox Sports Radio. Live from the Geico Fox Sports Radio studios, Jason Whitlock hanging out with us at Whitlock Jason. You can go follow him on Twitter. And Jason, one of the arguments you've made that I really like is your connection of sports culture to the way that people think. And in particular, the locker room culture is conservative. That is, coaches preach self-reliance. You have to be responsible for you. Don't blame external factors. Own your play. Rely on yourself. 
And that's kind of emblematic of a larger kind of culture in general, right? They're about a complete rejection of victimology. Every coach comes in, doesn't want any part of people feeling sorry for themselves. A coach may complain about the referees, and we got screwed, but he doesn't want his team or players getting involved in that. We don't have time for that as a team. It will cost us games. You, I'll handle the officials. You just play the game. And so much of where we're at in the media space, both the mainstream media and the sports media, is about portraying everybody as a victim. And so, again, when you've been taught since Little League football and Little League baseball, don't see yourself as a victim, don't complain about outside influences, any problem we have starts with the guys in this locker room or fixing it starts with the guys in this locker room, we don't care about outside forces. Yeah, the referees got it in for us, but we're so good, we're going to overcome the referees and whoever else is trying to cheat us. That's the mentality of sports. That's been beaten into the head of athletes uh, since the beginning of time. And when you make the conversation all about who's a victim, oh, my God, Colin Kaepernick's a victim. A victim, again, that doesn't play in sports. A victim of what? His own lack of self-awareness and savvy? Well, them's the breaks in the sports world. And so it's just off-putting and uncomfortable for traditional sports fans who just like, no, 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 there's no crying in baseball. I mean, some of these cliches that go along with sports, if you think about them and think about where they've taken the conversation, they're totally contradictory. Last question for you, Jason Whitlock. Go follow at Whitlock Jason on Twitter. Let him know what you think about this interview, as many of you will. If you are a GM, an owner, or a coach, would you want to sign Colin Kaepernick to be a backup on your team? I'm not talking about scheme. I'm not talking about whether you'd be running the same scheme that you played when you were Michigan's quarterback back in the day. Uh, <laughs> and and that's, Wait, a joke, that's a joke, by the way. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a joke. I want to make sure people are like, oh, Jason Woodlock didn't play quarterback. But, uh, that's a joke that you have fun with on Twitter. So I'm not talking about schematic fits and everything else. I'm just saying pretend that you have an opening at uh, at, at your backup quarterback position. Is this a guy that you want to bring in to represent your team? I don't know the answer. I'm curious what your answer would be. Represent? You're talking to – look, I played college football. I love football. That's what I've made my living covering. So just as a football person, no, because my backup quarterback has to help my starting quarterback prepare. I don't think preparation is Colin Kaepernick's strength. So just off that. I don't want it. When you add in the circus that would come along with him, city council people that know nothing about football, uh, having a strong opinion and having my character and integrity questioned based off of how I handle a backup quarterback, that's a joke that I don't want to be involved in. Uh, Look, a backup quarterback is supposed to be invisible, until the moment the starter goes down. Colin Kaepernick's just not invisible. So I, I just he's a bad fit as a backup quarterback. So there are people listening right now, well Colin Kaepernick's good enough to be a starter. How about as a starter? I, I don't too much of a circus, too many questions in my locker room, too many guy again, the media coming in and asking my entire locker room questions that ain't got a damn thing to do with football. And when you're again the NFL, you're thinking, oh my God, well, what do you mean these guys can't have an opinion about more than just football? I, when I'm ownership and I'm cutting checks to people for three million, four million, fifteen million, twenty million, whatever, I want them focused completely on football. I don't want go. Be focused on other stuff on your own time when you're in my building and I'm cutting these kind of checks. All I want to hear you talking about is football. If that makes me a bad guy, I'm a bad guy.
<laughs> Outstanding stuff as always. Go follow him at Whitlock Jason on Twitter. Watch him on Speak for Yourself and uh, consider yourself educated. I appreciate it as always, my man. Thank you, Clark. Go follow Jason Whitlock. Let him know. I always like to say this. First of all, Jason spends a lot of time with us. Every few weeks he comes on and will hang out with us for a few segments. And you guys always respond really well. If you enjoy Jason Whitlock on the show, and this goes for all of our guests, we're part of a big kind of fractious family. If you enjoy what we're doing, go tell our guests that you enjoyed hearing him. It makes a difference. I tell you this all the time. When I listen to shows, if I go on and then nobody reacts to anything I say, I'm like, damn. Well, is anybody out there listening? Uh, this audience is huge, right? We're on all 50 states, massive audience across the country. And I appreciate you guys. And I know that uh, the guests do as well, even if you don't disagree with, even if you don't agree with everything that you heard, just reach out to them on Twitter. You can always reach out to me. I'm at Clay Travis. Reach out to Jason Whitlock at Whitlock Jason at Jmart Outkick, who can't say the word penis without sounding like a uh, like a uh, sex offender. And, uh, and then we got uh, Danny G and Justin in the studio today. Um, and, uh, it's a big, you know, fractious family. And that's why I would say, go download the podcast. There will not be a, I guarantee you this right now. I will put my money on it. I'll put my life on it. There will not be a more entertaining morning sports show that airs from six to nine, certainly on Fox sports radio than the one that you just heard in all seriousness, millions of you are downloading the podcast. Now Uh, go download outkick the coverage. If you missed early parts of this show i guarantee you're going to be entertained by it lots of range lots of variety in today's show i just put up an article that i think is going to take over the sports internet today and we're going to talk with a guy tomorrow about it ties in a little bit with what jason whitlock was talking about on outkick the coverage espn is hemorrhaging republican viewers over the last year they have all abandoned the network because espn has gone left wing in sports there's now statistical data analysis to support that it's not just a theory the guys at Deep Root Analytics have proven it. They're going to be on with us tomorrow. This, I think, is a really intriguing question. As everything gets politicized in the world, sports, entertainment, culture in general, everything is politicized now. And you got to be careful and even-handed in terms of not alienating people when you talk about sports now. And I think ESPN is alienating people. Do I alienate people? Probably. But only if you suck. I'm Clay Travis. And damn it, this show isn't awesome and if i'm not loving hanging out with you guys every morning for three hours go download the podcast again outkick the coverage you can just search for outkick on itunes and tomorrow we're going to have another loaded show for you there's no games which means there's going to be even more frivolity whatever you do whatever you do make sure that you listen to hour two and don't listen to jason martin use the word penis is outkick the coverage on fox sports radio